Okay, yesterday we learned about the general concepts of what this thing called a confidence interval is. Today we're actually going to calculate it. What are the steps that we need to take to calculate the confidence interval? In fact, you're going to calculate a confidence interval for the data that you came up with. So we're all going to have different confidence intervals out here to try to figure out what is the mean length of the names of students at Elk Grove High School. All right, one of the key things that we need to be able to do to calculate this confidence interval is to find how many standard deviations, remember that's what z-score means, how many standard deviations do I need to go both ways so that if I have a normal curve, 95% of the scores will be within that range. Okay, Anika, like, what you do? Let's figure this out. Um, well, I know that there's 100% total. In yeah, 100% in the whole thing. So you have 95 in the middle, so there must be 5. Or 2.5 on each side. On each side. There's 5 percent on the outside, which means there must be 2.5 percent. Remember, a normal curve is symmetrical. There must be 2.5 percent on both sides. So you look that up, 0 0.025, and what you come up with? Uh, 1 point, well, for the z, I got 1.25. So negative 1.96. Yeah, it's symmetrical. Okay. Some of you may have just went and looked up 0.95, right? That's that. That's how you got the, the 1.65 gum. Uh, but we wouldn't look up that, would I? This is 95% from here to here. Looking at your charts, remember it shades all the way over. So that would actually be 0.975, and that would give you your 1.96. So empirical rule says two standard deviations. Yeah, 1.96 is about two standard deviations. All right, using the same idea here, I've got 98% in the middle. That means I have 2% left, 1% on both sides, you look up 0 0.01. Or you could look up 0.99, which takes you all the way to the other side. Is it like 2.33, something like that? So you got to go a little bit more than two standard <coughs> deviations both ways in order to capture 98% of the data. And then over here, what if I only want to capture 80% of the data? I know it's got to be between one and two standard deviations, right? One standard deviation is 68% of the data. Two standard deviations is 98% of 95% of the data. Must be in between those. 80% in the middle. I got 20% left over. That means 10% on each side. Be careful. This was 0 0.01. This is 0 0.10. Okay, and that means that that's a big deal. Oh, uh, what? 1.28? Something like that? Okay, this is going to be called the Z-crit, the critical Z-score that will get us there. All right, let's review the concepts that we went over yesterday. You guys were drawing some of these pictures. I just want to go over them one more time. And let's just focus on the 95% confidence interval in this example that I'm giving. Um, I've had a lot of people ask me, like, why isn't this whole thing the margin of error? So let's just go over this again one more time. This is what we're going to define as our margin of error. This distance, and if it's a 95% confidence interval, that must mean I go to standard deviations. Remember the formula for a standard deviation in the sampling distribution is the sigma over square root of n. So I'm going to have to go two of these both ways. But why is only this the margin of error? And here's the reason. Because if I get an x bar anywhere in this range and I go that distance both ways, I will capture the true mean. In other words, there's my x bar. It was a little bit more than the actual mean. If you go that distance this way and that distance this way, plus or minus that margin of error, then your interval will capture that true mean. Okay, unfortunately, if you're Sean, you're out here, and you go that distance, you won't capture the true mean. Okay? All right, so that is our formula for that margin of error. I need to go a certain number of standard deviations. Okay? Calculate our, to calculate what the margin of error is. All right, let's go through the whole process then. You guys took 20 of these out of here, and you found your X bar. They're up there on the wall. You're one of them. Okay, we're going to create a, mar, a, a, a confidence interval with the hope, with the goal, that inside of your confidence interval, the real mean of all of these uh, names, the length of the names will be there. I have no idea what the mean of these are. No idea. I've never done. I've never taken all 1,800, 1,700 of them and calculated the mean of them. But the mean of all of these will be in your confidence interval. Okay, we're a very good chance that that's going to happen. All right, so whenever you're asked to do a confidence interval, these are the steps that you're going to do, okay, every single time. You're going to write down the population parameter. You're going to talk about it. You're going to do your assumptions. 
you're going to write the test statistic, which is our formula. We'll talk about that in a second. Then you can actually do the calculations, okay, and then you're going to write up your conclusion. Tell me what the confidence interval means. All right, so the first thing that you're going to talk about is you're going to, you're going to describe what the population parameter is. Okay, the population parameter is what, what are we looking for here? In the example we're doing here, we want to know the true mean length of the names of students at Elk Grove High School. Those confidence intervals you saw on television predicting the election, you know, Obama's going to get 51% of the vote, plus or minus 3%. Their population parameter would be P is the true percent that President Obama gets at election day. Okay, so that's, that's what we define right up front what we're looking for. Okay, now we're going to do our assumptions. So let's do our assumptions for this particular problem. Did you guys take a simple random sample? You guys did, didn't you? Yes. Uh, what, drew out of a bucket? Now, let's just focus on this formula for a second. This is the formula that's going to create our confidence interval. We're going to start with whatever your x bar was. Who knows where that is? Okay, and then we're going to add and subtract the margin of error. Those are your two red lines over here. All right, the second assumption is... Well, that's a part of our formula. Is it okay to use that in our formula? That's why we're doing this assumption. In this particular problem, we actually have some math to do. Uh, your sample size was 20. Is 20 less than or equal to 10% of, I think it's about 1,700 names in here. Okay. Is 20 less than or equal to 170? Yes. That is the right formula to use. We can use that formula in our calculation. All right got something kind of confusing to go over now. Many of you are going to struggle with this for months. So let me just throw it at you and we'll, we'll go from there. All right, we did a lot of work last chapter about trying to figure out whether our sampling distribution, all of those X bars, will take on a normal shape. Remember that the first thing we said was if the population distribution was normal, then we knew the sampling distribution would also be normal. Okay, so we're trying to prove that the sampling distribution is normal. Now, why are we doing that? Because of this right here. Right? Didn't you calculate these critical z-scores from a normal distribution using those tables? Okay, you can't use that unless you were starting from a normal distribution. So that's why we're trying to prove that all those x-bars will be normal. So you've done many problems last chapter where they told you, didn't they, that the population distribution was normal? So if they tell you that, I think you got one problem tonight where they tell you the population distribution is normal, you would just write this. Yeah, the sampling distribution is normal because the population distribution was stated as normal. If they give you that, you're done. Don't do any more. But we also learned another case, right? If you take a big enough sample size, does the central limit theorem kick in here? If we took a sample size of 40 or more, then we know all those X bars would take on a normal shape. Okay? Now, are either one of those situations true for what we're doing in this problem? Do we know anything? Do we know anything about the shape of these 1,700 numbers? We don't, do they? They're probably skewed. What do we think they were? Skewed? Maybe right a little bit? Okay, so we don't know the shape of these. Do we have a big enough sem uh, sample size for central limit theorem to kick in? Oh, no. Now! We don't take a sample size of 20, right? Okay, so we don't know. So here's what we've got to do in that situation. Now, I've, I've circled or, because you're not, if you do this, you don't got to worry about this stuff. But in this unique situation, we've got a low sample size, and we don't know about the shape of the population distribution. So here's what we're going to have to do. We're going to say, okay, the only way this sampling distribution is going to be normal, because I took a low sample size, is if I assume that the population distribution was normal. And that's what we're going to do. These are called assumptions. So we're going to say, okay, we're going to assume the population distribution was normal, because if the population distribution was normal, then the sample distribution. Okay? Okay, so since our sample size was less than 40, we must assume that the population distribution is normal. All right, then we have perhaps another step we want to take. Let me ask you a question. You guys took 20 of these guys. Now, a normal distribution that's symmetrical, right? Isn't the normal distribution symmetrical? No outliers. 
Now, you guys took 20 of these things. What if your 20 had crazy outliers and crazy skewedness? Would that make you a little worried about your assumption of the whole thing being normal? Would that be a cause for concern? The sample you took wasn't even close to normal. It had crazy outliers. Would that be? Would that make? Would that call into question the population? You wouldn't even worry about it. So the sample you took's got some crazy outliers and crazy skewedness. That doesn't even make you scared about assuming that the whole the whole population distribution is normal. No. You know that Not even a little bit. You know that the smaller sample is more variable. Well, true. Okay. It does, uh, let me let me put it this way. It won't prove anything. Okay. Taking this 20 and looking at this 20, 19. Um, <laughs> taking a look at this 20 is not, I'm with you, it's not going to prove anything. But wouldn't it make you a little bit scared if, if these guys were crazy skewed? Crazy outliers here, wouldn't that make you a little more scared? A little bit, okay. What if these 20 had no outliers and, and no skewedness? Would it make you feel a little bit better about assuming that this population distribution is normal? Okay. I mean, cost got a great point. It doesn't prove anything, but it just makes us feel a little bit better, a little bit worse about this assumption. This is a huge assumption. I'm assuming this whole population distribution is normal. That's a big assumption to make. So I'm just taking a look at my little bit of evidence to see if how I feel about that. So that's what we're going to do. If you have the numbers, now go find your numbers. You got them somewhere in your notes? Some of you probably have them, some of you don't. Go find them. If you've got the original 20, we're going to analyze those 20 numbers. If you don't have them, like Jason, then we're done right here. We just make the assumption and we're done. But if you do have them, we're going to do a little bit of analysis on those 20 numbers. So you go find them. I should have drawn that. What's a picture that we've done that will quickly and easily tell you whether you've got skewedness or outliers? Box plot. There's actually another one, too. You guys remember that normal probability plot? You know, it's the one where if the dots came in a straight line, then the data was somewhat normal. That's a good one to do here, too. Okay. So put your 20 numbers in your calculator, if you've got them, and do a box plot of them. For those of you that don't remember, this one here is the normal probability plot. And if the dots come in in a straight line, then the data was somewhat normal. Okay, so that's one that you could do. You could also do a, uh, the modified uh, box plot, which I've got here. Now, when I draw my graph, I, I, I chose 20 out of there. And I had a weird one. My Q1 and the median were the same. That's why you're not seeing a line in here. So I did a modified box plot. So for mine, do I see any outliers? Are there any outliers in mine? No. I got a little bit of skewedness, but I wouldn't say crazy skewedness. So my sample, you know, a little skewed right, but it doesn't make me think that this assumption is totally off. So in my situation, I'd probably go with this. Just draw the picture. It doesn't have to have all the fancy numbers and all the, the, the glitz around it. Just draw the picture. And I'd say, well, since my sample has no outliers or strong skewedness, there is some evidence that my population distribution is normal. Now, your sample may say something completely different. Your sample may have a crazy outlier, a crazy skewedness. So then what I'd say is, since my sample has outliers and is skewed right, I question the assumption that the population distribution is normal. Okay? Not proving anything, all right? This isn't, this, isn't, this isn't definite evidence of anything. But it just, just makes me feel a little better about this or makes me feel worse about it. Now, those of you who don't have your numbers, 
then you can't do this step. You're just going to have to stay with that assumption. You're going to do problems. They're going to have you do confidence intervals, but they don't give you the data. Okay, they're just going to give you like, summary statistics, and you're going to solve it. So you're not going to be able to do this step. But I think on one or two of them tonight, you are. Now, do I do this stuff if they tell me the population distribution was normal? Heck no. Do I do this stuff if I had a big enough sample size for central limit theorem to kick in? No. Nah, I only do this stuff when I have to make that big assumption. Okay. All right. Test statistic. It's just the formula. I don't know, stat, statisticians got to use a fancy word for formula. It's just the formula that we're going to use. You're going to take your x bar and you're going to add or subtract the margin of error. All right, now calculations. We just plug in those numbers. Remember, we always write the formula, then we plug in the numbers. X bar. Everyone's got a different one, don't they? Okay. So I don't know what yours is. Write down your x bar. Madison, I'll work with you. What was your x bar? 13.2. So you're writing in your x bar, plus or minus. Now we're going to do a 95% confidence interval. So what is the number that I'm going to put in here? How many standard deviations do I need to go? 1.96. All right, now here's the deal. I didn't tell you what the population standard deviation was for this problem. Uh, I wrote it up there on the board. It turns out that these guys typically are about two and a half letters away from the mean. So we're going to go ahead and use that as the population standard deviation. So 1.96 times 2.5 over the square root of 20. Okay. Go find the margin of error for me. So this is 13.2. Yours is different. Plus or minus, what is that margin of error? Punch them in your calculators. television, right? Obama's going to get 51% of the vote, plus or minus 3%. That's it. All right, let's write it as an interval as well. So let's do the add and subtract. Oh boy, I'm in trouble here. Um, so I think this one's going to be 13 point... Let me out, Madison. Give me add and subtract that red line, that margin of error both ways. Right? You all started with different X bars. Wait a minute now, come on. Think about this. You only took 20 of these guys out of the. Could be infinite, right? If this is population size, it doesn't even matter. You only took 20 of them. And now, whatever your interval is, really good chance the true mean is in there. And you only took 20 of them. Remember when I asked you the first day how many of these guys would you want to take so you were pretty darn sure you got the right answer? Some of you said half of them or more than half. 20! That's all we took! Now I have a question for you. Let's see if this is kind of an understanding of what's going on. But there's about 40 of you in here. About how many of you have an interval in front of you that doesn't contain the true mean? We don't want them no. sure, but what how, about how many of them? How about how many of you in here do you think are sitting there looking at an interval that doesn't capture the true mean? Uh, I was going to say five percent. So and so five percent. So about two of you. Everybody get that? I mean, that's the sentence here. Before getting your sample, aren't ninety-five percent of them going to create an interval that gives you the right answer, captures the true mean? Well, that means that 5% of you, or 5% of 40, about two of you probably, have an interval in front of you that doesn't capture the true mean. You got unlucky. You got one of those samples on either side. Okay? All right, now we write it up. 
Okay, and I've already changed the wording. I change the word every single time I do this. So I change it again. So, before drawing the sample, 95% of all the possible sample means would create a confidence interval that captures the true population mean length of Elk Grove High School names. Is that sentence okay? Does that make sense now? 95% of those blue guys would create an interval that's going to capture the true population mean. Then we'll have one more sentence based on my sample. The 95% confidence interval is, and I would put those 12.104 to 14.296 letters. Your interval is different because you had a different exponent. Time for questions. So for the analysis of, of the sample, if if we get to that point, would we put that right inside of the number three with it under so the assumption? Put it where? It's so like after we say since the sample size is less than forty, we must assume. Um, do we put the analysis right? Yes, yeah, so I didn't have room, right? <laughs> yeah. So right here, you'd write analysis sample, <coughs> draw your picture, write up what you see. I just ran out of room. Just lost research so I am. Come on, there's lots of nobody, He's nobody. This is huge, man. You only took 20 of them. You got the right answer sitting in front of you. 38 of you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All these steps we've taken, we don't have to do them if it stops at yes for one of those answers. Sure. If, if, if they tell you the population distribution is normal, don't do. You know, do. This is why you know, it's going to be this one, or it's going to be this one, or in this case, we had a weird situation. We had a small sample size, and we didn't know anything about the shape of the population distribution. But the conclusion, though, we still... Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. So, so that's the only or, or, or. You're going to write this conclusion. So the five steps you got to do for any confidence interval, population parameter, assumption, write the formula, do the calculations, and write the conclusion. Okay, so your problems, we'll deal with that. Now let's go on to kind of next day stuff here. All right, let's really analyze this formula we've got here now for our test statistic and specifically the margin of error. Let's really look at that margin of error now. So this is our formula for the margin of error. What's going to happen to our margin of error? What's going to happen to this number 1.096 if we increase our confidence level? So in other words, instead of doing a 95% confidence interval, what if we do a 98% confidence interval? That may save one of you out there, won't it, maybe? Okay, maybe one of you that has, sorry, Sean, you're still going to be the guy, but everyone else, I'll probably save one more of you, got the right answer in there. But what effect is that going to have on our margin of error? Our margin of error will get, I got a higher and a smaller. Well, how about our interval? Is our interval going to get narrower or wider? So I'm looking at this guy. Is it going to get wider or is it going to get narrower? Um, if I increase the confidence level, it'll get wider. Why? Because including more numbers in the range. Well, let's look at the formula, though. Why, why you are, you, okay, look at the formula. What, what in the formula is going to change if we increase our confidence level? What changes? Yeah. The Z score. The Z score. Instead of going two standard deviations out to capture 95% of the data, don't I have to go 2.33 standard deviations out to capture 98% of those X bars? You're correct. The margin of error is going to get bigger. Okay, and that makes sense, right? If I increase that margin of error, that's why it's saving some of you. Okay, so it's going to get wider. The interval will get wider if you increase the confidence level. If you decrease the confidence level, it'll get narrower. How about sample size? Let's say we increase the sample size. What do you think is going to happen to the margin of error? More specifically, is our interval going to get wider or is it going to get narrower if we increase our sample size? Narrower. Why? Well, I'm just looking at the formula. Yeah. And it's on the denominator, so I can make it bigger. So if you make the denominator bigger, what's going to happen to the margin of error? It's going to get smaller, isn't it? But think about this logically, too. What's going to happen to all those X bars if we took a bigger sample size? 
those X bars are going to get more punched up, right? So we don't need as big a margin of error to, ca to capture that true mean. So if you increase your sample size, your interval is going to get narrower. Or your margin of error is going to go down. So look at the formula. Formula is just fine, but also understand how, how it works with the numbers as well. All right, the last thing is, let's just say we're looking at this and you're saying, oh my gosh, I'm a whole letter away. I want a smaller margin of error. Okay, I wonder how big of a sample size I would need to have taken. But let's say, let's make our margin of error like just 0.5. I don't want to say, hey, uh, on television, hey, I, I think the average length of name is 13.2 plus or minus 1.1. I want to say 13.2 plus or minus 0.5. Only I want to be on like half a letter margin of error. How big of a sample size would I need to have taken? Well, this is what we do. Okay, this is our formula for the margin of error. Correct? The margin of error is equal to the z crit population standard deviation over square root of n. I want the margin of error I just said to be 0.5. The z crit is 1.96. The population standard deviation is 2.5. And this is what I'm looking for. Go see if you can do the algebra and solve that for n. How big of a sample size would we need to take to get that margin of error down to only half a letter? So we're figuring out here. What, how big of a sample size would I need to take in order to get that margin of error down to only half a letter? So instead of taking 20 out here, what should, you, what should I have had you take out of here at a time? So that when we did these calculations, our margin of error would be down to only half a letter. A little algebra to do. you got to get that n by itself. Multiplying to come into effect here. Did I get a number yet? 96.04. Okay, so you're saying 96.04. Can I can I pick out 0 0.04 of these no. things? So, so always round up. Always want you to round up. Okay, that will guarantee we get a margin of error low. So I think I hear you saying 97. Yeah. Okay, how'd you get that? What'd you do here? And you need to show me this work, okay? Um, you have to multiply the square root of n over. You multiply by. F. How about this? How about just cross multiply? Yeah, just do that. Let's sure. do that. Cross <laughs> multiply, know. so I've got uh, 0 0.5 times the square root of n is equal to 1.96 um, times 2.5. Yeah. And Next then you step. Divide by 0. 0.5. Good. I just divide both sides by 0. 0.5. So now I've got the square root of n is equal to 1.96 <coughs> times 2.5 over 0. 0.5. And last step. Then you square it. Square both sides. That's the guy I want you to put into your calculator all at one time. Okay. You're going to show me that work, but that's the thing you're putting in your calculator. And I think what I heard is going to be 96 point something, always round up. So your answer is, if I'd have had you guys, instead of taking 20 out of here, if I'd have had you take 97, yeah. if I'd have had you take 97 of these out of here, when we went and did this formula, we'd have had a .5 here. And still, I'd only have only about one or two of you getting it wrong, Okay, but we had a much, much lower margin of error. But still, it's only about 100 of these, that's hardly anything. And look how close we're going to be now to the right answer. Okay? Any questions or comments? Mm -hmm.